Because tonight, we are not focusing on Jesus, but we're focusing on His mother. Mary was an important person in the Gospels. She was the mother of the Messiah. That's a pretty big deal. So tonight, we want to look at three things. How she was given a mission by God. How God confirmed her mission. And how God completed that mission through her. So I don't know if you guys knew this or not, but Mary was about 13 years old whenever this whole thing happened. It was a completely different world back then. At 13, they were considered adults in that culture. They were starting families. They were starting jobs and trades. They were going off having kids. Yes, at 13 years old. Which means everyone in here is very immature compared to the Israelites back then. It was a completely different world. They also didn't live until like 40 or 50 years. But she finds herself in an absolutely, insanely stressful situation. So we're going to start off tonight with the interaction between Mary and Gabriel. And so he tells her that she is going to have a baby, even though she's a virgin. So then, after he tells her that, she has to figure out how to tell her fiancé that not only is she pregnant, she's pregnant by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so she potentially could have faced rejection from her husband-to-be, her community. She possibly could have been stoned for infidelity. They could have killed her for that. And also just the fact that she's pregnant with the Messiah that they've been waiting for for generations this is an extremely stressful situation for a 13-year-old girl. And you thought final exams were bad. She could have reacted by giving in to her stress, but we see that in all of this, Mary trusted God because he knew that, or she knew that he would take care of her and that he would execute his perfect plan through her. So first of all, God gives us a mission. We are going to be camping out in Luke chapter 1. Yes, this is the Christmas story, but guess what? It is applicable any day of the year. Christmas is all year round. That's right. That's right. Until I dress like Christmas in July and you condemn me for it. So, first of all, trust God more than your circumstances. So let's look at verses 26 to 29 in Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 29. It says, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth. To a virgin engaged to a man who was named Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept wondering what kind of salutation this was. God gave Mary a very specific mission. She was to be the mother of the Messiah. From the human perspective, this made absolutely no sense. As Caleb initiated her. How was a virgin girl going to give birth? Yes. Verse 29 tells us that she was perplexed, which could also be defined as baffled, <coughs> confused, disturbed, and my favorite, flabbergasted. Yes. Because, first of all, an angel, this terrifying being who just popped up out of nowhere, is like, hey, what's up? And so I'm sure she was a little afraid and was screaming. But she was terrified or scared, flabbergasted, confused, disturbed by all of this that was going on. The Mark Santana translation of this from the original Greek would sound something like this. She was extremely disturbed by this, so she was stressed out, maybe even having like a panic attack. Uh. That, that bad. And thought to herself, what kind of greeting is this? He just pops up and says, hey, how you doing? She probably screamed a little bit. It's probably terrifying. That's why they always say, fear not. You guys remember when we talked about angels a couple years ago? Yes, they were terrifying. <laughs> They're not the Charmin things. They are scary. But she also could have been thinking, what in the world is going on? What are you talking about? And, I mean, let's be honest. She may have checked her grape juice to make sure it didn't accidentally ferment. Just saying. Mom? Ask your parents. <laughs> but there's a lot of stuff going on in these verses. So let's break this down just a little bit because God makes several promises in these verses. So first of all, it says the Messiah will be from Nazareth and from the line of David. Do any of you know how large Nazareth was? Like population-wise, it's, that's pretty close there. Close. A thousand? A thousand? Maybe. A thousand. A thousand. Don't be a cheater. Nazareth was the size of Odom. Oh, okay. About 500 people in the entire city. So that just that blows my mind that God chose this tiny little place to, to bring forth the Messiah. So this was not some booming metropolis. I know Odom, Odomites think that Odom is huge, no. but it's tiny. It was a close-knit community, but had little to no economic or political value. 
It was poor and poor agricultural town. There were no trade routes going through it. There were no valuable raw materials. And so really it was just a worthless place that was worth nothing. So from a human perspective, the Messiah coming from this tiny little town is laughable at best. Not Odin. Not Odin. No. Nazareth. Okay. Yes. But this gives way to Andrew saying in, um, in the book of John, verse 146, he says, can any good thing come from Nazareth? Like he was literally like, what is there in Nazareth that anything possibly good can come from it? Because it's a nowhere town. And so, but we see elsewhere in Scripture that God does things like this to prove, prove His sovereignty. 1 Corinthians one twenty seven states that God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. What's more foolish than a virgin getting pregnant and it being the Messiah? You would probably get committed to like a mental institution if you went around telling people that now. He chooses the foolish things of the world to shame the strong, and then God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Or foolish things to shame the wise, weak things to shame the strong. This tiny little town of 500 people, God chose to birth the most important person in all of human history. This tiny little town, the size of Odin, to where we would think that nothing significant would ever come out of it. Um, a biblical commentator by the name of John Gill wrote that the bloodline of David must have been in bad shape if the best representatives were a carpenter and a poor virgin, and both residing in so despicable as a place of Nazareth in Galilee. When we look at the genealogies in the Gospels, Matt, or, um, Joseph and Mary were both from the line of David. So Jesus was kind of double whatever the word there is. He was guaranteed to be of the line of David. We'll go with that. Another promise that he said was that the Messiah would be born of a virgin. And so this is an extreme importance to the mission of Mary and Jesus. For Jesus to be the perfect sacrifice, he has got to be sinless. According to Romans 5, 12, sin nature is passed through the line of the Father. So for Jesus to not have an earthly father means that he was able to bypass original sin. Now he could still sin, he had the capacity to do so, but he chose not to. Second, prophecy proclaimed that the Messiah will be born of a virgin. So Isaiah 7, 14, it says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and will bear a son, and he will be called Emmanuel. So back to trusting God with our circumstances, after getting over the promises. God calls us to do things sometimes that make absolutely no sense. But the benefit that God has that we do not is that he sees everything. We have a very, very limited scope in what we look at. If you watch like horse races and stuff, they have blinders on because it prevents them from being distracted, from being able to see the whole picture. So there's a picture on the screen, and here's all I want you to do. Tell me what this is. A tomato. I've heard a tomato. What was the other one? It's a lobster. It's a lobster. It's a Mars. Mars? I don't think so. All right. More than likely, there's absolutely no way you're going to figure out what this is. But... The awesome thing about God is God sees everything. So God sees the whole picture, which is this. No one would have ever guessed that this was the Oscar Mayer Wienermobile. But in our limited capacity as humans, when God calls us to do certain things, all we see is what's directly in front of us. And so it can cause us to get stressed out and cause us to focus on the wrong things whenever God is telling us, hey, you can do this. You just have to trust me. You just have to pay attention to what I'm telling you to do. So we need to trust God with the why. Let's look at verses 30 through 37. He says, The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I'm a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the holy child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. And she who was called barren is now in her sixth month. For nothing will be impossible with God. I don't know about you, but I love asking the question, why? Because when we ask the question, why, it gets past the surface level things and gets deep into the motivation that people have behind why they think the things they do or why they do the things they do. And so when we ask the question why, it gets to the purpose of everything. Everyone wants to know what their purpose is in life, right? We ask the question, why am I here? Why? Yes. And so this is exactly where Mary is. She's like, God, why are you telling me that I need to do this? And in God's grace, Gabriel tells her exactly what she needs to know or what she wants to know. 
In the initial introduction in verse 28, Gabriel calls Mary highly favored. God has chosen her specifically to do this mission because he knew, he knew that she could do it. She was to become pregnant as a virgin with the Messiah by the Holy Spirit through some mysterious miracle. She would name him Jesus and he would reign forever. He would be called the child of God. Now remember that Mary was disturbed. She was troubled and she was stressed about the fact that the angel was in front of her. And now she has this responsibility of raising the Messiah. Think about the magnitude of this. It's your responsibility to raise the Messiah. He has to be sinless. You have siblings, us adults, most of us have kids. I can't keep my kids from attacking each other on a daily basis. How am I going to keep them from not sinning? And even just not even the physical aspect of it, but it's impossible for me to prevent my kids from sinning in their heart. And so you're looking at Mary and Joseph, this fallen man and this fallen woman who now have to raise the Son of God to be the perfect sacrifice. That had to be extremely overwhelming. Had to be stressful. Probably had them at a point where they just really felt like they couldn't do it. But our kids are also not like Jesus. I'm sure being a sibling of Jesus was annoying because anytime they would blame something on Jesus and the mom would go, well, Jesus is perfect. I'm sure that would be annoying. Yeah. Why don't you ever believe me? Because Jesus is perfect, son. That's what you always say. But here's what you guys will understand when you become parents. From a parental perspective, the responsibility that we have for our kids is so much different than anything you experience right now. And so looking at Jesus, Martha and Joseph, Mary and Joseph, excuse me, they had the responsibility of making sure that they raised the Son of God correctly. But Mary was told by Gabriel what was going to happen. He gave her the why that she needed. All Mary could do in this situation was trust God. Like there was literally nothing else that she could do. There was no way that she could accomplish this on her own. She was a fallen woman. Joseph was a fallen man. And now they had to do what no one could really do outside of God himself. So verses 34 and 30 through 37, Gabriel tells her exactly how this is going to be accomplished. How is this possible? First of all, he says, the Holy Spirit and the power of God will be the source of the virgin birth. So he takes the responsibility off of her saying, look, we are going to handle this. We want you to be a willing vessel, be submissive to what God is calling you to do, this mission that he has given you, but ultimately God is going to take care of it. Second, her relative Elizabeth, who was buried, would also have a child. So he made a promise to her that Elizabeth was going to have a child as well. And then third, he says nothing is impossible with God. And that's an important thing for us to remember as well, and we'll get into this a little bit later, but when you really think about the fact that God calls all of us to a specific mission, God is not going to call you to something that He can't accomplish through you. So you really don't have to be worried about that. So Gabriel gave her the reasons, and she trusted these things to be true, and then God confirms that. So two, God confirmed the mission. So first of all, what God does to confirm His mission is He speaks through His Word. So there are two instances in the first chapter of Luke that we see that God confirms His promise to Mary through His Word. He proclaims two promises to two women in two completely different situations. So with Elizabeth, we see in um, verses 7 and following that she's a righteous woman, but she was also barren. And so a woman during this time, if they were not able to have kids, they felt like they were cursed by God. Because having kids was seen as a blessing, and for them not to be able to have any, they thought that they were cursed and that God hated them. But then in verse 13... An angel comes and reveals to her husband, Zacharias, that they are going to have a child. And then not only that, but this child is going to be the forerunner to the Messiah. So her son is going to be the one who proclaims that the Messiah has arrived. And you guys know this person as? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Thank you. So yes, John the Baptist is promised to them to show them that that's going to happen. And then the second one is Mary, which we've already discussed, her becoming pregnant as a virgin. And that was confirmed by God speaking His Word, and He fulfills His promises. Second, God speaks through circumstances. We have discussed Mary's interaction with Gabriel, but what about Joseph? What could Joseph possibly be thinking in all of this? My wife is crazy, or my fiancé is crazy. I have got to get out of here. So Matthew 1.19 really gets to this. And it says, and Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. He planned to divorce her. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to say Mary is your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. 
And then he goes and talks about how this is Jesus. He's going to be the Savior and how it fulfills prophecy. And then in verse 24, Joseph woke up from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. So Joseph was ready to walk away from this relationship because initially he didn't trust Mary. But then an angel came and told him, look, everything is okay. This is exactly what's supposed to happen. Just trust that this is going to work out the way that I tell you it is. And so he said, okay. And he followed through. And then third, God speaks through people. There are several examples of how God confirmed his mission for Mary through the lives of other people. So we mentioned Elizabeth. We mentioned Joseph. We mentioned John the Baptist. But God also used the wise men. These men were not even um, Jewish. There were Zoroastrians, which you can go look that up later. But it's a completely different religion who was big into like astrology. And so they would follow the stars. And so they saw the star over Bethlehem and they followed it directly to Jesus. And when they got there, they presented him with gifts, confirming the fact that they believed that he was the Messiah. So that was confirmation from other people to Mary and to Joseph from what God said. Also, the shepherds, the angels revealed themselves to the shepherds. And then the shepherds went to Mary and Joseph and reiterated what the angels told them again, confirming the fact that he was the Messiah. And then we get in Luke 2.35 to where we see a man named Simeon who was a prophet who addresses Mary and Joseph and tells them Jesus is the Messiah. He's the one that we've been waiting for, that he would be appointed for the fall and the rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed and his sword would pierce even our own soul. So he tells her, look, this is the Messiah we've been waiting for. This is going to change a lot of stuff in Israel and across the world, but your son is going to die and you're going to suffer greatly. And so he tells her in chapter 2 that this is what's going to happen. But here's one of the cool things about all of this. God was calling Mary to be the mother of Jesus, but he was also moving the lives of all of these other people to confirm the calling that he had on Mary's life. So God was working not only in her life, but in the life of Elizabeth, in the life of Simeon, in the life of John the Baptist, in all of these people to, to prove to her, hey, I'm calling you to this very special thing. And you can trust me that this is going to happen. And so he uses people in your lives to confirm the calling that he's put on your own life. Which, that's exciting to me, and I've seen that same thing in my own life. But here's the big takeaway from this point. We don't always know how God's working in other lives to get us where we need to be, but he is working. We can't see the big picture. Just like with the red square or rectangle and then the Wienermobile. We couldn't see that that's what it was in the same way. God may be calling you to do something very special, but you can't see everything else that's going around that's going to help you to achieve that goal that God's calling you to. But God can see those things, and He works in the lives of the people around us to get us to where we need to be. And then we have the opportunity to do the very same thing for others. So when we desire to know God's will, when we read His Word and pay attention to our circumstances, and we need to listen to the godly people in our lives, God's will is not some great mystery. You know, we always want to know God's will for our lives. But a lot of times we don't know because we're not reading His Word, we're not looking around us, and we're not listening to God the people in our lives. If God has a mission for you, He's going to be clear and concise with it. But we don't focus on listening to God because it causes us to stress out about what He's calling us to do. So when we know the will of God, no matter what it is, He is going to give us peace that surpasses all understanding. Third, God completes the mission in us. Everything at this point was in motion. Mary was pregnant. Joseph was on board with this. The mission had been confirmed by multiple avenues. And now it was time to carry it out. God does not call us to a specific mission and then abandon us. He is going to be with us through the entire thing. Remember earlier when I mentioned that Gabriel called Mary highly favored. You guys remember that? Do you understand that when we look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, God calls, or Paul calls us the very same thing? Let me read these verses to you. Ephesians 1, 5 and 6, it says, In love He predestines us to adoption as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace with which He favored us in the Beloved. The word favored here is the same as in Luke 1, 28. In the original Greek, we've got the word up here. <laughs> it is the word karato or karato, which means to grace that is in due with special honor, to make accepted, or to be highly favored. So the same way that Gabriel tells Mary you are highly favored, Paul says that each one of us that are believers in Christ 
are highly favored as well. And so I think a lot of times we put Mary on this pedestal like uh, we could never do what Mary did. But God's not calling you to do what Mary did. God's calling you to do what He is desiring for you to do. And He's saying that because you belong to Him, you were highly favored just as much as she was. You were just as special or as important as Mary was. So why did God choose to use Mary and why does God choose to use us? Because He uses humble people. God used Mary because she was a nobody. She did not think very highly of herself. She was not full of herself. She was a humble servant. She was willing to submit to God's calling instead of her own. Because of her willingness to submit, God used her to do something amazing. And we see this in her words as a response to her calling. In Luke 1, 46 through 49, she just speaks these beautiful words. She says, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord, how my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he took notice of his lowly servant girl, and from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one is holy, and he has done great things for me. So she could have gotten a big head and bragged about the fact that she was, going, she was raising the Messiah, but instead she puts all the attention to God. And said how awesome God is that he could use someone like me. Even though she knew her mission would cause pain and suffering, not only to her, but also to her child, she was faithful. Can we say the same thing? If God told you, I'm going to use you to do amazing things for my kingdom, but it's going to cause you to suffer, would you be willing to do it? From a parent's perspective, and I'm sure the parents in here can agree with me, we want to do everything that we can to protect our kids from pain and suffering. But Mary knew up front that this had to happen for God's will to be achieved. And she was submissive. She didn't stress out about it. And she trusted in God. In her humility and her submission, she trusted Him completely. He calls us to do the same thing. We cannot be focused on the outcome, but we need to be focused on the one who's calling us. God's going to take care of everything. We just need to be submissive. We are not promised a comfortable life, but we are promised that Christ will never forsake us. So second, God uses faithful people. Don't let your fear and your stress keep you from being faithful. In John 19, 25, the prophecy of Jesus' suffering is fulfilled right in front of His mother. Just a few verses earlier, Jesus was beaten and crucified, and now He's hanging on this cross, and we get this bird's eye view of what's going on right there. In verse 25, it says, But standing by the cross of Jesus were His mother and His mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Mary was at the moment in her life that solidified this mission that God had called her to. Everything that she had done prior to this was to fulfill the prophecy that was going on now. Seeing her beloved son hanging on the cross, knowing that he was innocent, had to cause her severe pain and suffering. But she knew what God had called her to and ultimately Jesus' purpose for being there. She was faithful even through the suffering. Scripture does not explicitly tell us that Jesus appeared to his mother after the resurrection, but I really think that he did. And I say that because of the last verse that we're going to be looking at, which is Acts 1.14. In Acts 1, Jesus appears to his disciples and he ascended into heaven. And then the disciples went to the upper room. And it said there was about 120 people in the room at that point. And Acts 1.14 states that these all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Mary remained faithful until the end. She was still worshiping through the most painful moments in her life. And even after her mission was complete. Our work does not stop when our mission is completed. God calls us to our next mission assignment. So don't be stressed out or anxious about what's next because God is going to lead you. So let me ask you a question. Why do we experience stress over the missions that God calls us to? Why do we experience stress over the missions that God calls us to? Because you want it to be perfect sometimes. Because you want to know if that's exactly what God wants you to do. Because... I mean, you surrender your life and stuff, and it could be weeks, days, years, and whatever you want to do. Okay. Anybody else? I want to know all the things. Yeah. We're just two. Mm -hmm. We're going to get from point A to point B, and yeah. this, and what we're trying to do, and all the things. She says she wants to know all the steps. Oh. And something different? Yeah. What? We're kids. The disciples were teenagers. Okay. They were scared too? I bet you they were. They were stressed a little bit. But 
I wonder if we really believe that nothing is impossible with God. I wonder if we really believe that God can do anything. Because if we truly believe that, it would cause us to pay attention more, to focus more, to read the Bible more, to live out this faith more. When we feel like God is calling us to do something, whether that's going to ministry, going to missions, or even go across the street, we begin to mentally question if it's actually God calling us. We make excuses. We try to convince ourselves that it's a mistake and do everything that we can to not do it. Like I mentioned two weeks ago, we allow the what-ifs to take control, and we stress out about it so much that we end up not doing it. God calls us to trust Him with the whys, the hows, and the what-ifs. Imagine what would have happened if Mary didn't do what God called her to do. The Messiah would never have been born. And we would still be lost in our sin. Even though Mary didn't understand why she was chosen or how any part of the whole situation was going to work out, she still surrendered her life to God. In the face of what was surely one of the most stressful events imaginable, Mary had a choice. Was she going to do what God called her to do or was she going to do what she wanted to do? She could choose to freak out and worry about the unknowns, to worry about the what-ifs, or she could choose to trust God with each one of her doubts and to surrender. God was bigger than her stress, even though she knew what would eventually happen. She was still willing to surrender. Now what about you? God isn't calling you to bring the Messiah into the world, but He is calling you to take the Messiah to the world. He's calling you to live out your faith. God's desire for each one of you is, His mission for each one of you is to share the gospel and lead people to Christ. As many as possible. If you don't do what God is calling you to do, who will? Think about it like this. I had a choice whether or not I wanted to be submissive and follow ministry. I surrendered because God made my life miserable, but I could have said no and would have spent the rest of my life miserable. Had I not submitted to the will of God and gone into ministry, how many of your lives would be different right now? A lot of them. You have the same calling on your life. God is calling you to do something important. And if you tell God no, then that means that something is not going to get done that needs to get done. If God calls you to surrender your life, whether it be to ministry or missions or going across the street, sharing the gospel, living out your faith, whatever it is, He's not doing it just to entertain you. He's doing it because you have a purpose. Because you are important. He designs you to do these things. The mission that God is calling you to is to impact the people in your life. There are people that are around you that I would never have the opportunity to share the gospel with. But you will. Are you doing it? And if you don't, who's going to do it? It's a great honor to serve the Lord. It's a great honor to be called highly favored. For you and for me, there's peace and calm in the life of the person who chooses to choose obedience, even though we may not understand what God is doing. So as we close, let me remind you of this. God gives you a mission. God confirms the mission. God completes the mission in you. So don't allow the stresses and the what-ifs to derail you from your mission. You were highly favored if you were a believer in Christ. And that God is going to be with you from the start to the finish. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this evening. I thank you for the time that we're able to dive into your word. Lord, I know the time is short. But as they go and spend the next little bit of time in small groups, I pray that you'd be glorified. Lord, that you would help them to dive into your word. Lord, to take it seriously. And to just really think about the fact that you have called each one of us to a mission. And it is your desire for us to fulfill that. I pray that in days that we will be stressed out or days that we will be struggling, Lord, that if we are a believer, you would remind us that you have called us highly favored. That you are going to be with us through thick and thin. And Lord, that you do amazing things with people who are humble and are faithful. So Lord, be glorified in our actions. Be glorified in our thoughts and our conversations. And just help us to lead people to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.